What's up, Meta Nerds? This video will be a complete breakdown of the Trandoshan species, from their homeworld, biology, culture, and impact on the galaxy, as well as ending on some behind the scenes facts. But first, I want to thank this video's sponsor, Keeps. Guys, did you know that two thirds of men will experience some form of hair loss by the time they reach 35? Keeps is the hair loss company to work with since they let you work with doctors from the comfort of your home. You'll chat with them online and they'll review your situation and make the right recommendations for you, with the product being shipped out every three months. And keep in mind that prevention is key, that all treatments like this take four to six months to take effect, so act as quickly as you can. Don't wait until it's too late. And they have generic versions of FDA approved medications that make it a lot more affordable. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss today, go down to keeps.com slash metanerds or click on the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash metanerds. But let's get back to the Trandoshans. Trandoshan is actually a basicification of the word to Doshak, which is what these lizards called themselves in their native language of Dosh which is also their name for their homeworld. The Mid-Rim planet registered as Trandosha at grid coordinates P9, located within the Kashyyyk system. Kashyyyk is the name of this system's sun, but also the name of the planet that is home to the Wookiees. The star system had one sun and eight orbitals, which combined had at least 57 moons, which all made for a very active sector of an otherwise quiet part of space. Their homeworld was covered in oceans and dense jungles and forests, though there were some large areas of sun-baked deserts called the Scorch. Deadly predators arose under the waters and beneath the shade of the trees. Things like enormous jellyfish, sharks, frist wolves, and other lizard-like creatures that the Trandoshan evolutionary ancestors fought against for millennia, forging the sentient, cold-blooded, dominant species we see today, which reached 42 million individuals, being at all times throughout their history around 99% Trandoshan. They would hatch from eggs, and groups of usually four siblings that would be called clutchmates, and this nest would be in warm places in their home or in the Scorchlands. As soon as they emerged from the egg, they were able to walk and hunt on their own, though most parents would keep them in some protected area like their homes to keep them away from the endless predators of their homeworld. Indoors, their natural hunting instinct would express itself in constant play. If a Mama Trandoshan would ever let an outsider into their home during this time, you would have seen little lizards chasing each other all around the house, hiding and pouncing on each other at all times of the day and night. They would rapidly mature, developing a skin that was smooth to the touch, but thick and scaly, usually in hues of tan, brown, and green, though there was a very rare bluish variant, with limbs that ended in these three large digits tipped in razor-sharp claws. These hands and feet made it difficult for them to use many types of blasters, weaponry, or even daily items, and clothing that was often made for humanoids with hand and feet a lot closer to humans. This is why they'll often be seen not wearing any shoes, as finding ones that fit was often difficult, and most Trandoshans felt that shoes were useless and just took away from their dexterity, with their thick scales providing plenty of protection walking on any terrain or metal surface. Their eye color ranged from yellow, orange, or red, and allowed them to see in the infrared range, perfect for hunting other saurians into the dark jungles. Joining the hunt from an early age, most parents would take their two-year-olds out for their first hunt, and by the age of 10, most were proficient in unarmed combat, as well as melee weapons and firearms. While being considered younglings until they were 11, young adults until 15, and being adults from 15 to 35 reaching their average height of 2 meters, or 6 foot 7 inches, making them taller than most humanoids, but still shorter than Wookiees. They were over the hill at just 35 years old, elderly at 50, and if a Trandoshan ever lived past 60, this was considered venerable, and a sort of blessing by the Scorekeeper. The Scorekeeper was a female deity worshipped all across Trandosha. She was a being outside of space and time that enforced a morality that revolved around the hunt, rewarding individuals with Jagannath points for individuals related to the hunt. A cynical interpretation of this belief wonders if it was put in place by some early Trandoshan political power in order to direct a people bubbling with murderous energy, sending them out towards animals and other sentient species instead of towards each other. It seems that the Trandoshans developed space travel before first contact with the Republic, as their feud with the Wookiee people is treated like a cultural constant by both species, as if it had been going on for longer than anyone could remember. The Scorekeeper was said to heavily reward the killing of Wookiees, and coincidentally, the Trandoshan economy loved the trade in Wookiee pelts, as these soft, warm, and stylish garments were loved by the many different species that the Trandoshans traded with, but also themselves. Being cold-blooded creatures, it was a truly euphoric experience to sit in the sun covered in your hard-earned Wookiee fur coat. 
Silverback Wookiees brought on an extra sense of luxury and status, and the scorekeeper rewarded even more points for these kills, while the most points were achieved by killing infamous Wookiees that had slain Trandoshan brothers. The raids from these alien lizard people becoming a major part of Wookiee culture, and both cultures bred fierce warriors, each growing stronger in time as this feud created a sort of arms race, one that often resulted in Trandoshans literally losing their arms. These lizards are strong, but for a hairy species that could rip the arms off a Gundark, taking these hunters' arms was fairly easy. Bosk lost one of his arms to a Wookiee, and a slaver named So had both of his arms ripped off by the infamous hairball Chewbacca. And this wasn't even that embarrassing. In fact, he bragged about it as being the only one to fight Chewie and survive. You can see these small limbs growing back, like how most lizards can grow their tails and some reptiles can't even regrow their limbs. The Trandoshan was able to fully retain this ability even at a larger size. And after many months, they would be fully replaced. Though this was painful, burdensome, and could lead to a Trandoshan being captured, tortured, or even killed by these Wookiees. So they would almost always hunt in packs with a massive arsenal of blasters, explosives, traps, and tools, knowing that if you came to Kashyyyk unarmed, you would leave de-armed. Worse is that if one was captured, they would lose all of their Jagannath points accumulated over their entire life. The only way to get these back would be to kill the one that captured you. If so, you regained all of your points plus some, and upon one's death, the great scorekeeper would place her warrior in a spot fitting of their status. Like a sort of Valhalla with multiple tiers, where great warriors could trade stories with their peers, only very few being able to sit at the legendary hero table, sharing a feast with the heroes of old across all time. The Trandoshans would join the Old Republic around 7,000 BBY, and were fluent in both Basic and their native Dosh, being literate in both, though when speaking with each other, and especially on their homeworld, they would stick to Dosh, a writing system that had an alphabet comprised of lines and dashes. Now finding themselves in a galactic community, they started collecting Jagannath points from bounty hunting, mercenary work, or as raiding slavers. Nothing worse than being taken alive to a Trando. Jagannath gets wiped, start from scratch or die without an afterlife. Not what he wanted. Still did him a favor. These people were not foodies, and even with a billion culinary options at their razor fingertips, they always preferred a bowl of live worms and a traditional flat cake made from plants from their home. Though they did develop a taste for alcoholic beverages like wine, which caused them to break out their ancient lizard dances that amused other species, often being the only ray of lightheartedness ever witnessed in these cold, violent beings. A dance that Bosk's father, Kratosk, was known to perform in the Bounty Hunter Guilds, where other hunters would learn that despite being rivals, the Trandoshans also shared the Wookiee practice of life debts. This was also seen with the Gungans, Nogri, and Tals, where one would pledge to protect the one that saved their life. Their term for this bond was a Grakowsk, and this was sometime taken advantage of, at least once by a Snivian species named Marn, who tricked Slisk into thinking he had rescued him from a piece of falling machinery. While the Trandoshan's favorite part of the galactic community were the tech wonders of droids and weaponry, they quickly replaced hard labor with X-10D draft droids, but only for those who had a high enough score, which on the worldly plane had to be mediated through the Elders, which of course involves some politics that we'll look at in a second. Though Bosk was one of those great enough to have one of these droids, which he kept on his ship, the Houndstooth. But the Elders said it was open season on any weapons that they wanted to get their hands on. Their natively developed weapons were the Accelerated Charged Particle Array Gun, as well as a Repeater and Gatling Gauntlet, all using a railgun-like technology to propel a solid projectile, making them one of the few people like the Tuscans to use solid rounds instead of energy balls like most blasters. Major companies picked up on these designs and made their own, developing new variants and bringing the style of the weapon into the modern era. Hmm. An energy weapon that looks like a slug thrower. I didn't think lizards were that nostalgic. With many bounty hunters choosing these types of weapons to use on organics. Dirge loved the Gatling Gauntlet, and the advantage of these solid projectiles is that they better pass through some personal shield types, armor, and flesh, though an energy weapon was almost always better against droids. Many Trandoshans would end up buying from the legacy gunsmiths that dominated the galactic market, but those weapons were influenced from the Trandoshan designs. While many would also pick up the standard energy rifles and pistols, Bosk and his father would use a Relby V-10 micro-grenade launcher, which was the best of both worlds. Being a solid projectile, but also a modern marvel of those aliens over at Blastech Industries, they were able to turn something the size of a bullet into a micro-grenade, making it perfect for hunting the largest of game, and eliminating all kinds of targets and their armor, packing 55 micro-grenades into a standard magazine. 
For live captures, they used the Slave Master Stun Carbine, and the one weapon that was produced on world and remained coveted by the Trandoshans and aliens alike were the Chalon Ore Blades. This Chalon Ore is extremely rare and heavier and sharper than what most of the Republic's base was able to produce. Being a double-bladed sword that was not a vibroblade, yet still proved viable in modern combat. During the Old Republic era, one Trandoshan named Kaizen Fess was one of the few of his people to avoid the bounty and slaver path, and instead rack up favor with the scorekeeper by hunting big game all across the galaxy, like his father before him, who died hunting crate dragons on Tatooine. He would hunt one wild beast in the Shadowlands of Kashyyyk for three weeks, before it somehow blinded him with a light burst in the infrared spectrum, followed by goring him and taking his eye. A little insight into the way they infused meaning into almost anything. He refused to get this fixed with modern tech, since this was a lesson from the scorekeeper. Why settle for being half blind when there are substitutes available? He would befriend a Jedi Master during the Galactic Cold War, and in their conversations we can get a deeper look into their mindset and culture. The Jedi would try to get him to see how killing the sentient Wookiees was wrong, but Kaizen's reaction was as if this was an incomprehensible claim. The Wookiees are noble people, not animals for you to kill. <laughs> And we see that the scorekeeper rewards those who visit the sites of great fallen hunters, with Kaizen wishing to go to his father's grave on Tatooine. During his time with the Jedi, he would undergo a ritual called Shikoyagu, which could be undertaken once they reach middle age, where they would fast, meditate, and keep physically training, sparking a complete replacement of their skin and growth of new muscle. Trandoshans would typically replace their skin cells over the course of a year, resulting in normal shedding, but this process was a much more deeply involved rebirth. A very painful process that for some marked the end of the hunting period of their life, and they would become elders to settle down and help run their society, as well as mentor younger hunters. But some would pass through this ritual and use their new strength to power their hunts for the rest of their lives. Kaizen mentions that he would drink Nacus leaf medicine on an empty stomach, which helps the skin to molt in this period of rebirth, though it induces vomiting, fever, and burning in the sinuses. In this time, the scorekeeper sees them as neither dead nor alive, and thus unable to do anything that would affect any one score, leading him to withhold any advice to help fellow hunters, almost like a vow of silence on all things related to the great hunt. To prove they understand that all life feeds on other life, when they were reborn through this molting process, the final step was to eat their own flesh. The first meal in this new life was their own shedded skin. And Kaizen tells us that this dish sits like hard rocks in this long, fasted, empty stomach. Shortly after he finished this ritual, he encountered a Wookiee named Gwaror who hated these lizard people, bragging that he had claimed the heads of more than 40 Trandoshans, killing them in their weakened state during their Shikoyagu. The Wookiee claims that it was payback for the Trandoshan tradition of turning Wookiees into pelts, something Kaizen admits without shame and says that he had personally done. After he kills the Wookiee, they learn that there was a Trandoshan that was working with this Wookiee to get their own people killed, something that shocked the Jedi, but Kaizen's calm understanding of this shows that this must not have been unheard of. He just says that for some, credits are enough reason to turn against their people and the scorekeeper. Like all sentients in the galaxy, there were of course a spectrum of beliefs across individuals, and Veneb Drask was one that did not adhere to their cultural norms. To make it worse, this Veneb was a clan elder, and by using this Wookiee to kill off his rivals, he had grown strong alliances and was about to become a clan speaker. This made for a theological issue, getting at the very nature of the Trandoshan god, as Kaizen struggled with the issue that Justice now saw Veneb as prey, but his success and growing power was seen as proof that the scorekeeper was favoring him. It may seem simplistic, but success in gaining power was the strongest evidence for the will of the scorekeeper. If you were doing bad, you didn't have her favor, and if you were doing well, she must have favored you. So speaking against a powerful elder was by definition to disagree with the will of their god. Kaizen declaring, what could he say? I am judge? I am wiser? He knows that many elders would respond that this was not his concern, that those in his rank should just focus on gathering more points. But he thought, prayed, and issued a Grajath, which was a formal dispute which would have to be resolved between the two parties before Veneb could be promoted. This could be hashed out with words or violence, and whoever wins would take the other's points. Veneb denies everything, but snaps at one of his men when they worry about the Jedi. 
shouting to remember his teaching that no one controls them, not the Jedi or Scorekeeper. This was the ultimate blasphemy, and he goes on to explain that they grew tired of serving her. They created their own morality and would hunt others to serve themselves. The Jedi sees the parallel to his own order and the Sith who broke away, and in the inevitable battle, this deceiver would be struck down, and his men wanted to join Kaizen, forming their own clan with him as their clan leader. This is a process that had likely happened countless times over the millennia, as one leader fell away from the path for one reason or another. Other things we learn from Kaizen is that he says most ships will refuse to take on Trandoshan passengers for fear of violence, or charge more, or make them sleep in cargo holds, and he admits that so many of his people reinforce this stereotype that he kind of understands why it's a good rule of thumb. <laughs> But he is glad that a Jedi took favor of him and saw that he was different. And when he talks, we hear Trandoshans use the term hatchling or soft thing as an insult. While their belief in the scorekeeper expanded into abstract concepts like ignorance or justice, producing hunting-based verbiage like one should stalk ignorance, and when speaking of one who deserves death, saying things like they were the prey of justice, that the hunt and the collection of Jagannath points was synonymous with righteousness and truth. But the Council of Elders was just the highest ring of a class system that was not rigid or obvious, but still stifling enough for some Trandoshans like the assassin Nakaron, who got himself banned from his hometown of Forak and then just about everywhere on Dosh for his disrespect. While others abandoned their scorekeeper and their religious culture out of their obedience to the Jedi Order. One famous Jedi Trandoshan was Mursk, who died in 1032 BBY, a generation before the Sith Empire transformed into the Brotherhood of Darkness. It would be fascinating to hear what a Trandoshan thought of the Scorekeeper after they learned to embrace and live in the light side of the Force. We don't have any writings or holocrons from them, but they were all against violence, and perhaps thought the Scorekeeper was just a made-up myth created by the ruling class, or maybe that it was some sort of dark side manipulation, sort of dark side demon, or perhaps instilled on their people by some ancient Sith. In around a thousand BBY, when the Brotherhood of Darkness would rise to be the new United Sith Force, they would take control of the sector with two of the strongest and deadliest species by overwhelming Trandosha. Massive burnings of jungles and cities, devastating the homeworld, and using this system as a foothold. The next thousand years of history would be covered in darkness. By the time of the Clone Wars, the Trandoshans had become more isolated than ever, working in their same capacity to rack up points, usually associated with the Underworld, while Trandosha's political representation in the Senate was, through all things, a Wookiee. Senator Yarua represented all of the Kashyyyk system, earning him hatred from both his scaled and furry constituents. At least one terrorist organization couldn't stand this, and Yarua was nearly killed by an assassination attempt by Trandoshans. By 22 BBY, the Clone Wars tensions exploded, and the historical violence and underworld connections of these lizard people combined with tons of actual Trandoshan mercenaries, slavers, and hunters working with the worlds that seceded, increasing the tensions between these people and the Republic. Some Trandoshans saw this war as a Jagannath point boom, and many CIS forces were aided by Trandoshan generals. The Acclimator class, the Prosecutor, was taken by a slaver leading a battalion of droids, a scene that played out countless times across the galaxy, culminating in the ultimate hunt. The full might of this technological superpower was used to appease the Scorekeeper in a crusade that promised to conquer the Wookiees completely. The invasion of Kashyyyk was a hunt and collection of Jagannath points on a scale their ancestors only dreamed of, especially with all the silverback Wookiee generals leading from the front. It was also during the Clone Wars era that Bosk would rise to become a galaxy-renowned bounty hunter working alongside the young Boba Fett, and Ahsoka would be hunted down in the time-honored tradition of collecting sentience to release into private game islands, on their Trandoshan moon of Waska. Garnak was the owner of Island 4, one of thousands of islands that would have been stocked with all sorts of game, and used both by the owner's own clan, or to host alien hunters for a fee. One of the bucket list experiences for hunters of all species all across the galaxy, ignoring Republic law to hunt things from crates to Jedi usually operating from the safety of their floating fortresses. When the Empire came to power, it was the greatest thing to ever happen to the Trandoshans, allowing them to act as slave camp operators and overseers of a program that would use the powerful Wookiee people that helped Yoda escape to build countless Imperial facilities, including parts of the Death Star. 
Fosk would work with countless individuals, including Ezra, but later mostly with the Hutt Empire and Darth Vader personally. This Imperial era would see Naka and his team hunting Wookiees on Kashyyyk, only to have all of his men killed by Black Chrysanthemum. Noka himself only surviving because he gave up info on his employers that Black used to hunt them down as well. Faresk's Sat was one of the few to fight in the anti-imperial capacity, being a member of Vanguard Squadron in the New Republic after the Battle of Endor. While their bounty hunting tradition was as strong as always as late as 9 ABY, with these people filling up the ranks of the Bounty Hunter Guild. So that's it for the breakdown, but you definitely want to hear these cool facts and behind the scenes stuff. There were a ton of visually different depictions of Trandoshans in media, from the movies to the games like Dark Forces and Republic Commando, even in the Clone Wars TV show. Because of this difference in the movies, they came up with a subspecies, the Saurans, a people whose lore has been expanded a bunch and I hope to cover them one day, but they never directly say how they split. My best guess is likely through their own exploration of the galaxy, they were somehow cut off and evolutionary diverged in isolation, or perhaps some were kidnapped and transferred by some other species and their distant past. One weird fact I wasn't sure what to do with is that the gravity on Trandosha is listed at only 0.62 standard. Which would have been cool to see, and perhaps played a role in putting the Ahsoka Hunted episodes on the moon instead. Also, Jagannath is a deity under Hinduism. It's a bit complicated, but the word itself apparently means Lord of the Universe, and is where we get our English word Juggernaut. A lot of details from this book come from the Essential Guide to Alien Species, Complete Locations, Guide to Droids, and the Alien Anthology. If you made it this far, the best way to help me out is to hit that like button, leave a comment about this video or something else you'd like to see, and subscribe if you want to see more, where you can see discount links to cool things like amazing metal print art and free audiobooks from Audible. There's also our Patreon and PayPal. Special shout out to our supporters over on Patreon, especially our $25 tier supporters, Matthew Beltrami, Bill Payne, and Brandon Robinson. But most important of all, remember, it's okay to discriminate against giant violent lizards who all explicitly worship a murder deity. And the force will be with you. Always.